Today, we are joined by Robert Henna. Robert Henna is an independent philosopher, co-director of the Online Philosophy Mega Project, Philosophy Without Borders, and director of the Contemporary Kantian Philosophy Project. This will be the second part of our conversation in which we discuss the sensibility first approach, non-conceptualism, and the effect of reason. And going back kind of to the question, like how we can interpret Kant, you put like an approach forward yourself, which is called uh, the sensibility first approach. Um, so maybe you can um, briefly introduce that. What is that approach? Um, I mean, you even mentioned that this might be shocking for some people. So um, Right, right. Yes. yes. Although I put shocking in yes, uh, yeah, scare yeah. quotes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it might shock only Kantians. Yeah. But, yeah. So when I try to explain it to my daughter, she says, oh, that's interesting, daddy. What? <laughs> Yeah, so not too shocking to her, but um, yeah, so the, um, so a standard approach to Kant, uh, since the, you know, early phases of interpretation of Kant during Kant's own lifetime, was to treat him as a rationalist of a new sort. So obviously he was responding both to the classical rationalist tradition from Descartes through Spinoza and particularly Leibniz, um, and also responding to the classical empiricist tradition, particularly through Locke and Hume and to a somewhat lesser extent um, Berkeley, and was offering something that was supposed to, as it were, get between or to transcend, criticize both classical rationalism, classical empiricism, and offer a new kind of view. But I think right from the beginning, uh, it was held that Kant was essentially a rationalist of a certain new kind, and that the appeal, as it were, roughly speaking, the empiricist side of Kant, the appeal to what he calls a faculty of sensibility, which is a, a actually, it's actually a, a composite capacity, which involves a capacity for sense perception, um, and a capacity for um, sensation, broadly speaking, feeling, um, what we might call consciousness um, nowadays. Um, and also it includes desire, capacity for desire, a capacity for um, emotion and so on. That that somehow, that aspect of us is less, although it's there and Kant postulates it, um, as a necessary feature of the, you know, the human mind or human cognition, and not just cognition, but also um, human action and um, <clears throat> agency. It's there only in a, um, a no, I don't want to say derivative, but less important. It's not what's fundamental about it. So it's sort of an accidental sense. So it's an accidental feature of our nature that we're sensible beings, that we're finite beings, that we, you know, represent through space and time and so on. But what we really are is reasoners capable of, you know, self-consciousness, capable of forming judgments, capable of forming chains of judgments, logically connected chains of judgments, logical reasoning, capable of practical deliberation uh, in order to choose and, and act. Um, and that that's what's essential to us, and that's broadly a rationalist approach to the hum to human nature. I've called it, and I'm not the only one who's called it this, it's broadly an intellectualist approach to human nature. You might say a top-down approach to human nature. Um, and it connects with certainly aspects of, important aspects of Kant's view, his notion of enlightenment. You know, so he says, dare to know, dare to think for yourself. So you might think, ah, that's what we are. We're just thinkers, we're just knowers. And so, you know, this is a kind of new kind of Cartesianism and so on, and that the sensible side of us is secondary. Yeah. But the approach that I'm suggesting wants to say that there's a sense in which, there's a sense, an important sense in which the sensible side of us is fundamental in that it grounds all other aspects of what it is to be a human being. This is not to say that there's not an intellectual side to us, that there's not conceptual reasoning, that there's not conceptualization and judgment and logic and all the rest of it, but that it's got to be embedded in a sensible ground of some sort, uh, that it's 
it's not reducible to it in any way. That would be something like an empiricist, a classical empiricist approach. But that we neg if we neglect our sensible side and, and the contributions of sensibility to cognition, knowledge, reasoning, um, and to indeed our conception of philosophy itself, but also to the practical side of philosophy, the practical side of ourselves, to ethics, the sensible contribution to ethics, the sensible contribution to politics, uh, political um, philosophy, and so on, then um, not only are we misinterpreting Kant in some important way, we're also getting, <laughs> getting it wrong about the nature of what it is to be a rational human being or what it is to be a rational human animal um, and giving us a false conception of what it is to be us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I've tried um, through various, you know, sometimes more textually oriented writings, <clears throat> essays, and books, and so on, to try to develop as the aspect of Kant and the texts. There are quite a few texts where Kant does really uh, emphasize this sensible, not just inning, but sensible ground or partially constitutive sensible contribution to all human reasoning and cognition. And then I've also tried to develop that view um, independently of you know, just text interpretation. Um, and I think that although it typically, it typically uh, encounters strong opposition from Kant scholars, so if I presented a conference or something, people will, and I say, so here's this non-conceptual, or rather this sensibility first view, and I'm defending a view of Kant that we might call non-conceptualism, sort of a you know, scholastic-y type turn, term, and then people would just roll their eyes, oh, there he is again, um, and doing it. But in fact, I think the, the one thing I'm rather pleased about is that uh, quite a line of discussion and just even the narrow Kant framework has grown out of that sort of, you know, everybody wants to show that I'm, not everybody, but people want to show that I'm wrong. And so that's nice, you know, so they're, <laughs> so if I haven't changed anyone's mind. Uh, it, it's generated a fair bit of thinking about Kant, and I think it's a good idea for people to, you know, think critically about Kant and Kant interpretation in that way. Um, and it, I think, it has changed the, you know, the the dominant interpretation of Kant, which is conceptualist. Again, this techie term, but for a strong intellectualist view, I think nowadays it's just the case that a weaker intellectualist view is now the norm mm -hmm. but it's because i think in part uh people have been pushing some people have been pushing a sensibility first line and so i so i think it's fruitful even if no one if, even if it's not the standard or mainstream view mm -hmm. i think it's, it's fruitful to think about mm -hmm. because it 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 as it were liberates aspects of kant's philosophy that might not have been looked at closely before and i think that's particularly true in the ethics although I've written lots about the, you know, the, the, its role, the, the sensibility first approach to the theory mm -hmm. of philosophy. But I think in a way, um, if people could then, as it were, move on from the sensibility first approach to the theoretical philosophy to the practical philosophy, then I think it would have an even greater impact on how, not just Kantians, but people outside the Kant tradition uh, are thinking about Kant and Kantian approaches to ethics and politics and so on. Yeah, definitely. And and regarding so before moving on to like the practical side, in the theoretical side, so so I mean I was reading part of the literature talks about indeed this conceptualism versus non-conceptualism. I think that has right, been right. one big debate. And and indeed now there's more depth to that debate in the sense of what kind of conceptualism are we talking about? When is it non-conceptualist? Is it with regards to intuition? Right. Is it with regards to uh, perception, etc.? So how do you yeah. stand on these kind of distinctions now within this kind of conceptualism, non-conceptualism, broadly speaking, but then also with regards to, for example, uh, perception? Yes. So the, um, the debate about conceptualism and non-conceptualism, if I'm right, uh, goes back to two ways of thinking about Kant's philosophy. Um, one of them which focuses on uh, what's sometimes called, or maybe I've called it, the togetherness principle in Kant's 
which states in the first critique, which is that thoughts, thoughts without content are empty, intuitions without concepts are blind. And then he goes on to state that cognition that is not both, con roughly speaking, conceptual and intuitional is not you know, fully meaningful cognition. Now, that view has been taken to mean that um, intuitions, which are sensible representations of objects, and then either, and it splits into empirical intuition, which is sensible representation of contingent um, you know, objects in the world or aspects of objects in the world. And then Kant also thinks that there's um, intuition, which he calls pure intuition or non-empirical intuition, which is a representation of the forms of our sensibility itself. Roughly speaking, they're representations of space and time as structures um, that people have thought that those are purely passive aspects of human cognition, and they're just there to trigger conceptual activity, judgmental activity using concepts, logical activity. And so when Kant, when Kant says thoughts without content are empty, that means it's got to connect to intuitions. Intuitions without concepts are blind. They take that in a very strict sense to mean that intuitions are, as it were, nothing without conceptualization. And that it's conceptualization that first makes them into something that a rational animal um, like us could recognize. And so conceptualization is, roughly speaking, an informing of, as it were, mute cognitive matter provided by the senses, but the senses are only there to, as it were, trigger the activity of conceptualization and reasoning and intellectual capacities generally. And so when we do come to represent the world and when we do come to form thoughts about it, when we do come to form theories about it and so on, that the content of those thoughts, theories, cognitions, or in the case of, let's say, perception as a representation of the judgments of, you know, in perception, which Kant calls judgments of experience, that the content of those representations is entirely determined. This is the conceptualist view, is always and strictly determined by our conceptual or intellectual capacities. That the role, therefore, the role of intuition is just as, as a is just as a trigger to the activities of the conceptual side, the intellectual side of uh, of the mind, and that if there's to be justification, if we're to offer reasons for claims and so on, they you can never appeal. According to this view, you should not appeal. You can never reasonably appeal to intuition as a source of reasons, intuition as a source of something that's normative in character, that is to say something that provides, you know, ideals or standards or rules by which we operate as rational beings, that all of this, all, all of normativity and all of justification uh, comes, and just as the individuation of our contents of representation comes from the conceptual side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so stronger or weaker, yeah, stronger or weaker versions of that. Um, but the, the strongest conceptualist position is well, intuition, and this, this was developed in the neo-Kantian tradition, that really there is no such thing as intuition. Mm -hmm. We should get rid of that uh, altogether. It's simply an activity of conceptualization, and conceptualization actually produces its own earlier form, which we call intuition. I see, and actually, I, I've also heard like um, people looking at McDowell, for example, that yes. kind of take this conceptual space to be yes. the only space, or at least uh, um, sensibility is in some sense also active. Yeah, the, what so, he calls the, the unboundedness of the conceptual, I think. And yeah. This is in Mind and, and well, yeah, well, and so and that book, uh, you know, Mind and World, which was from the mid 90s, 94, I think, mm -hmm. um, had a tremendous impact. Well, because, because McDowell was both an analytic philosopher and a former student of Peter Strawson's um, and was therefore at that time placed quite centrally in the analytic British side of the analytic tradition mm -hmm. um, for McDowell then to be offering an interpretation of Kant, but also an interpretation of Kant that connected quite closely with the Hegelian tradition mm 
the neo British neo Hegelian and American neo Hegelian tradition was regarded as a huge event, not so much by analytic philosophers, but by those who were working outside the analytic tradition as a way of bridging. So this is something that this is back to this, you know, this this divide between analytic and continental philosophy, that in the 90s, it was thought that McDowell was providing a bridge by developing this conceptualist reading of Kant, which then connected it to Hegel, but McDowell was also able to connect it to <clears throat> um, what you might call a domestic tradition within analytic philosophy, which was um, a broadly speaking descriptivist approach to reference, um, but also um, linguistic philosophy. So, you know, a linguistic approach to philosophy. And so McDowell was able to pull all of this, oh, also together with McDowell's interest in Donald Davidson's philosophy at the time and in Wilfred Sellers's philosophy. So all of this was in play in a very interesting way in mind and world. And it, and it really excited people, again, not so much in analytic philosophy, who often rejected McDowell precisely for doing something unusual and different uh, in that way, historically oriented, but also moving, you know, looking towards a broadly speaking continental uh, approach. But it, it inspired a great deal of work amongst continental philosophers who thought that they could now find a way of talking to analytic mm -hmm. philosophers. But interestingly to me, and uh, you know, and I think that's great. So McDowell's work is fantastic, it's terrific, and so on. Um, to me, it was also very interesting in the sense that, and also troubling in a way, that it was emphasizing a size of a side of Kant mm -hmm. and also a side of analytic philosophy and in the analytic tradition, um, which it seemed to me is actually mistaken about <laughs> actually mistaken about the rational human, not just about the text, but about the rational human condition itself. And so my own work was actually much more influenced by uh, Gareth Evans mm. um, and a book he wrote called, or well, he died before it was finished, called Varieties of Reference. And Evans was slightly older than McDowell. And I think he, he and McDowell were colleagues, but in a sense, um, McDowell was a student. Mm. Evans, and Evans was extremely and died um, in his 30s, I think. Mm. But anyway, Evans was developing a view which is um, non-conceptualist. Mm. And it's also a view which picks up a certain side of analytic philosophy and connects with the phenomenological tradition, a certain side of the phenomenological tradition. And then I could see, it seemed to me, I could see how it connected to the sensibility mm -hmm. first side of Kant. And so, um, it seemed to me, even though it was wonderful and important that McDowell was providing these bridges between the, or seemingly providing a bridge between the analytic and the continental tradition, it was a false, <laughs> it was a bridge that actually was false about human nature. And so it would, if one were trying to get an, from my point of view, an accurate and correct and true view of, you know, cognition and human nature, and also the right view about topics even as narrow as, say, direct reference theory and philosophy of language and so on, we had to develop this other side, this other strand of thinking, going right back to Kant, but also tracing it through the analytic tradition. And certainly when I was just finishing up in graduate school, I was writing in the philosophy, in analytic philosophy of language as well. Um, and I was within what that time was called the direct reference tradition, the Kripke, Putnam, my own teacher, Ruth Bark and Marcus, they were all important figures in that tradition. And then I was trying to connect that to the Kantian tradition at the front end on the, the sensibility first side, but also to Gareth Evans' writings, and then um, to Heidegger, Heideggerian writings, Husserl, there's an aspect of Husserlian philosophy which connects to it. Um, contemporary direct reference theorists at the time like David Kaplan, um, there's an aspect of Russell's theory of reference early and try to bring all that sort of stuff together, not just to get published, although it did get published some of it, but uh, because I thought it was actually truer than a strictly descriptivist, you know, conceptualist kind of a 
much. And then it became clear to me that conceptualism, as one of my former graduate students pointed out to me, he said, Concept the conceptualism, non-conceptualism debate sounds like the most tedious, scholastic, narrow debate. But actually, when you understand what it's really about, it's just one of these, once you've taken a stand on it, it changes your view of everything. Mm, I see, yeah, so it's, it's fundamental and it uh, triggers down to- Yeah, in, but in a, in a surprising way that, and mm. I think just because it, you know, are you taking an intellectualist view of human nature? Um, that's what this conceptualist approach really is stating. Are you taking an non, not anti-intellectualist in the sense of rejecting intellect or mm -hmm. yeah. reason, but an, a non-intellectualist approach that emphasizes our humanity, our embodied nature, yeah. and these other fa aspects of our sensibility or not. And it, you know, not only does it change the way you look at philosophy to shift from one of those points of view to the other, I think it changes the way you think about yourself too, right? You think that you're essentially a disembodied, or you could be at least in possibly disembodied mind or soul or something. That's one way of thinking about your own nature. If you think that you're essentially embodied mm -hmm. I see. Um, as, as a thinker, as a, as a agent, um, as a, creature that feels and reasons and so on, that changes your view about yourself and changes your view about yourself and how you relate to other people. And ultimately, I think how you do politics, but further down the line. Okay, very interesting. And, and I mean, I've actually been doing a Kant reading group myself and we've been kind of discussing McDowell and especially uh, uh, with regards to sellers as well, like the given, yeah. like what to do about the given. So how would yes. you respond? Yeah. Because many of uh, people in that group actually say, okay, if you indeed have this non-conceptualism, then you are actually com uh, committing uh, yourself to the given. So how do you respond yeah. to that and how do you avoid it? Or Yes, yeah. well, this, is, <laughs> this, is, this, this response is so common that I've but the myth of the myth of the given, right? So, oh, yeah. yeah, so the myth of the given, according to Sellers, is that somehow the impacts of the world, the causal impacts of the world on our sensibility, the myth is that those somehow have representational force and somehow have an impact on what Sellers calls the space of reasons, which is really, roughly speaking, normativity in a broad sense with respect to rationality and thinking um, and that it's a mistake to according to the the myth of the given it's a mistake to think that anything that's merely causal and therefore outside the rational realm could somehow have these you know have rational import normative import and so that's that's the myth of the given that it somehow does um, but my claim is that, in fact, that's taking a very narrow view of what the sensible side of human cognition is, again, making it essentially passive, but not only passive, merely mechanical in a certain, in a broad way, and um, basically saying that the mind starts with a causal domain of processes, which somehow mysteriously give rise to content which then needs to be formed by <clears throat> conceptualization um, and uh, you know logical thinking and so on but it always seemed to me that if it weren't normative all the way down it could never become normative in other words the transformation of brute and this is this is what's true in a way about the the myth of the given is that you could have somehow a direct connection between what is merely causal, what is merely material, what is merely biological processes or non-biological processes into the normative. But what you shouldn't infer from that, I think, is that somehow reason and conceptualization or intellectual capacities come along and transform what is otherwise mute causal impacts into something normative. Really, what you should be thinking is actually we're normative all the way down right through right from the intellectual side of our nature through sensibility and that our connected with our connectedness to the world in the first place shouldn't be described in terms of a dualism a material spiritual dualism as it were you know a mind-body dualism of a certain sort between a merely material mechanical natural world and rationality, consciousness, subjectivity on the other side, but that in fact, 
our connection to the world is normative from the start and that the world has normative components built into it mm. so, so, from the so, get-go yeah um does that commit you like to the view that that nature in itself is is, is normative or is that is that too far it does no no that's not too far i mean there are different ways of cashing that out <clears throat> um now uh one of them is roughly speaking you know um panpsychism or pan experientialism which is a view that's been around uh well in some ways um since Schelling and you know some post kantians um but i do think that if you hold that necessarily the world cannot exist that is to say the world that we experience cannot exist unless it conforms in some you know sense to the nature of our minds then that's a thesis about manifest reality itself and so what it means is that um you know that somehow our kind of mind is at the root of what nature is in other words that what counts as natural and what counts as cognitive mental subjective and so on um they shouldn't be identified and you wouldn't want to reduce one of them to the other but they are according to this view necessarily connected um and so in that sense the world as a whole would have a at least as far as <clears throat> you know, its basic properties are concerned it would have a mentalistic element it wouldn't follow that there were always minds around to be perceiving things in order that they exist but it would have to have built into its nature structures and properties that were of a mentalistic sort and so that you know the overall character of the world would be roughly speaking dual aspect so it would have a you know natural component material um component of the sort you know studied by physics and biology and so on fundamental physics and fundamental biology and so on but it would also have an aspect without you know um detriment to the first aspect it would also have an aspect that's mental broadly speaking mental uh, but that's there from the get go in other words that's there in its nature and so it's not it's not panpsychism but it's what i call liberal naturalism so liberal liberalism says yes there's a fully natural world but the fully natural world contains mental aspects well contains mental structures and properties at the basic level even if you know creatures animals with minds themselves haven't evolved at that point or you know do not exist at that point but there's there's something in the nature of the natural world itself that's of a mental character I see, I see. And, and that allows you then to indeed take the non-conceptualist view and then the normative jumps in very quickly. Um, so that's kind yeah, of... Yeah, the normative there, the, the possibility of the normative is there from the start, right? Because mm -hmm. that which is, if that which is natural and that which is mental are not in a, you know, in a dichotomy, in, not in some sort of dichotomy, then normativity, at least the, poss the real possibility of normativity goes all the way down into the nature. Mm. Of, really, of course that's a form of idealism a form of a rather weak form of idealism but it also if you hold that view if you hold the liberal naturalist metaphysical conception then it makes it i think infinitely easier to try to explain how it is that consciousness emerges mm. creatures of a certain level of biological and physical complexity because otherwise you would have to have a jump again from the brute material natural you know fundamentally physical world into the into the you know opposed fundamentally mental and non-physical uh world which would be a gap and a mysterious mm -hmm. gap to close just in the way that you know to come back to conceptualism and non-conceptualism there would be this mysterious gap between the impacts you know of a fundamentally material physical world upon a creature that then somehow mysteriously manages to convert that input into something normative you know rational conceptual and so on so um i talk about what i call the grip of the given which is this 
sensible side of our cognition, this starting point for cognition, which isn't just a temporal starting point, it isn't just a causal starting point, but is also a normative and representational starting point of a different kind than conceptualization, but that conceptualization could not, our capacity for conceptualization could not be fully meaningful and not connect to the world in the right way unless we were engaging with the world at this more, well, basic in the sense of first and foremost and grounding, but not basic in the sense of everything needs to be reducible to it. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay, very interesting. And if we now take kind of the, the sensibility first approach to kind of what we've been discussing and, and this non-conceptualism. Yeah. So now let's bring it to the practical sphere. So how do we do that? Yeah, yeah. And what are the implications basically? <clears throat> yeah, so so my picture, uh, so I started working mainly in Kant's theoretical philosophy, um, but I was also teaching practical philosophy and not writing about it so much, but studying it. Um, and as I thought about the development of the non-conceptualist position and the sensibility first approach, then it, it seemed to become clear to me that just as we need to emphasize the cognitive starting point in you know, sensible intuitions and then um, also feeding into perceptions and sense perceptions and so on, on the practical side, we need to do something parallel which is to take very seriously the thought that roughly speak. So Kant in the first critique says, although all of our you know, cognition begins in experience, it doesn't follow that it arises out of it. That is to say that it's somehow reducible to experience. And that's the, that's the rationalist side of Kant, but it also brings in the, you know, the sensible starting point that something very similar holds in the practical philosophy. So what I would want to say in the practical philosophy is something like, Although all of our agency, all of our moral agency begins in, roughly speaking, desires, feelings, and emotions, it doesn't follow that it all arises out of it in the sense that it's reducible to it. Now, cashed out in the practical philosophy, I think what that really means is, although we are first and foremost sensible beings in, as uh, agents, <coughs> And although first and foremost, um, we're desiring creatures with a will. So Kant's notion of the will is a, it's a complex faculty, but at the very least, it involves, uh, you know, feelings, desires, emotions, uh, and so on. That that is how we're moved towards agency from the very start, including moral agency. But there are aspects of our approach to moral deliberation and so on, which are not reducible to this sensible starting point. And even more than that, there are aspects of sensibility um, which are of a specifically moral sort. And that would, that, would, that would conform to, or that would be parallel to what Kant calls pure intuition. So mm -hmm. speaking, the role of pure intuition in the theoretical philosophy would correspond to a rough, a pure kind of um, moral affect, or pure kind of moral emotion um, on the practical side, and that it would indeed be a ground for all moral agency in just the way that, you know, our representations of space and time, our pure intuitions, are a ground of all specifically human cognition. And so, well, if I can see those parallels, then why don't I just try to develop that view further, but also look around for Kantian texts that perhaps push in those directions. Mm -hmm. If this were possible, it would have a tremendous impact on some classical problems in Kant's view, like the extreme moral rationalist approach that's often ascribed to Kant, what's called Kant's formalism, what, what's called Kant's, you know, that we can't appeal to anything material, mm -hmm. as to say sensible, in order to justify moral claims or moral agency. Um, Kant's rigorism, that is to say, Kant's seemingly ex commitment to extremely universe, extreme universality of moral principles that can never be 
violated like you know uh, it's impermissible to lie or something like that um, that uh, starting with a broadly non-intellectualist sensibility of first approach to Kant's account of agency and the nature of human agency would help out mm -hmm. several of those classic problems um, just within Kant's interpretation but also um, in the debate between Kantian approaches to ethics and non-Kantian approaches mm -hmm. to ethics and so I started to develop that just as a neo-Kantian you know as a as a Kant inspired view but then I started discovering texts all over the place too and particularly <clears throat> in Kant's later um, reflections uh, on religion of all places mm -hmm. It turns out, of course, that religion plays an important role in Kant's ethics, but um, in uh, religion within the boundaries of mere reason, um, there are many remarks that uh, I take to support a broadly sensibility first approach to Kant's mm -hmm. ethics, and that pick up on themes that were already there in the second critique, but which were not well represented and groundwork for the metaphysics of moral. They show up in Kant's lectures on ethics as well. Mm -hmm. But what most people read when they, you know, if most people have studied, anyone who has studied Kant probably at the very least has studied groundwork of the metaphysics of morals. Um, and then they may have studied, you know, prolegomena to any future metaphysics or something like that. But um, groundwork of the metaphysics of morals is a what I would call a problematic Kantian text, even though it's one of those texts that people regard as like, you know, Descartes' Meditations on First Philosophy. You have to read it if you want to read Kant. And once you've read it, you can sort of stop reading Kant because that's all you ever need to know. Um, because it's, ex it's quite one-sided towards this non, you know, intellectualist approach to Kant. Um, and he's not in that text, um, He's not at all careful to say, oh, by the way, I didn't mean that all, you know, feeling and desire and emotion is bad. What I meant to say is that we shouldn't reduce moral claims to claims about what makes us happy in an egoistic sense or what makes us happy in a beneficial sharing, you know, um, benefits, benefits over, you know, populations of people or I'm not just talking about, you know, pleasure or, you know, what is inclined to make us, um, give us the most pleasure. I'm talking about moral principles which hold independently of consequences of various kinds. He could have said, but he didn't. He could have said, oh, by the way, I'm not rejecting the claim that in fact we're sensible beings mm -hmm. and that it's okay to, you know, love to do the right thing and it's okay to, um, you know, have certain kinds of, in fact, not just okay, but partially constitutive of our morality, our, you know, from a Kantian point of view, to be moved by our love, broadly speaking, um, for the categorical imperative as an expression of our highest nature, of the highest good that's in human beings. And then when we find this aspect not only in ourselves, but in others, we're becoming aware of their dignity. And we have to expect, by virtue of feeling that love, basically, of, of a you know, moral sort, we're respecting their dignity. Mm -hmm. And then Kant's ethics goes nowhere without you know, emphasizing the role of moral emotion, particularly in the form of respect, mm -hmm. also in the uh, form of um, a certain kind of happiness, a kind of higher happiness um, that we can achieve when we're acting for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. This also uh, refers, I think, to um, like normally people talk about the effect of reason, but you call it the effect of reason, and that, that's yes, yes. Just indeed uh, yeah. kind of the, the, the other side of it. Yes. So there are various sort of uh, prima facie problems with Kant's ethics or classical problems with um, Kant's ethics. And one of them is that in order to be, so Kant claims that in order for us to um, carry out uh, morally right agency, we have to be free. Or 
So this is a trick. He also, or a tricky question. He also seems to say, well, sometimes he says, we must be free. And other times he seems to say, we must have a representation of ourselves, what he calls an idea of ourselves as acting freely in order to be moral beings. Now, the, I think he's committed to, the strong position he is indeed committed to is that it has to be really possible for us to act freely and not just represent ourselves as acting freely. Although in order to be agents, we do indeed need to represent, we, we do indeed need to have an idea of ourselves as free agents, but even more um, fundamentally, we need to act freely. But then quite a few philosophers said, well, I mean, critics of Kant said, so tell us how this freedom is possible. And Kant says, well, it has to do with our noumenal nature. Now, that's a problem, right? Because, of course, in the theoretical philosophy, he does say many times that we don't know things in themselves, uh, what their nature is. Um, it would then follow that we didn't know what our own nature was if we ourselves have a noumenal aspect, you know, as we are in ourselves. Um, we don't know the, sometimes in the, crit, the theoretical philosophy, he says, we don't know whether noumena exist or not. Sometimes he seems to say that we do and must know that they exist, but the same problem would hold with respect to our noumenal selves, that uh, if we were being uh, agnostic and critical in the, on the theoretical side, we should therefore be agnostic and critical on the, on the practical side. It would therefore follow that if we were to act freely, we wouldn't have any way of knowing how this happened, and it would be a mystery. Mm -hmm. And so he seems to be saying, oh, but we have to believe in this mystery, otherwise ethics will not be possible. Now, that's more or less where things stood at the end of the groundwork of the metaphysics of morals, that we have to have a representation of ourselves as noumenal beings freedom, or at least the representation of freedom, has to be possible in order for ethics to be possible. And then the obvious critic is, yeah, but if we don't know anything about it, then how can we, you know, the ethics could be entirely empty. Yeah. So in the second critique, the critique of practical reason, he said, well, in fact, we have <clears throat> something, an experience, or um, a consciousness, a mode of consciousness, Call, which I call the fact of reason, which is a consciousness of our capacity for acting freely and autonomously according to the categorical imperative. Um, and therefore it's evidence. It's evidence for uh, our own ability to act freely. And he also there seems to connect it with the feeling of respect that he says is a, an absolutely necessary feature, in which I talked about briefly before, but is a respect for the dignity of persons, oneself and others, which is an absolutely necessary feature of our moral nature in the sense that we act for the sake of our, Kant says explicitly, we act for the sake of our respect for the moral law, which is in us. And so it's a, you know, a feature at least as, a, as far as a representation of it is concerned, a feature of us. And therefore, when we respect others, we respect their ability to represent the moral law, but also the nature of them as, as persons capable of acting for the sake of the moral law. We respect their capacity for freedom. So the fact of reason, now postulated by Kant in the second critique, um, would give us direct evidence for first of all, our own dignity, but also the dignity of others, but also our capacity for acting autonomously or freely. Then what I want to say is, this is not a conceptual representation. The fact of reason should be thought of as primarily an affect, and therefore the affect of reason. But it's a, it, and he does say it's specifically, it's a mode of consciousness, um, that it's in the form of a feeling but it's a form of a specifically moral feeling. And then that would enable us to say that even if you're not self-consciously aware 
of the moral law, even if you're rather unreflective, um, you know, as a, as a moral agent, you could still feel this love for, you know, this affect for yourself and for others, and also feel that the highest good in the world is to act for the sake mm -hmm. of, you know, moral principles which are not reducible to various contingent or, or empirical or sensory factors. And so that would be roughly speaking expressed. So if you saw someone treating someone else extremely badly, um, violating their dignity or, you know, I mean, even just being rude to them in a certain way, but, but you know, much, much more torturing them or doing something terrible to them. And you had a direct awareness of this being absolutely wrong. You wouldn't necessarily have to be reflecting on the nature of moral principles and you know assembling whole chains of reasoning and so on. you could just have a direct insight into the fact that this was absolutely wrong and that there's you know a, a, a respectful way of treating them mm -hmm. and could be manifest in the you know the, the fact of reason and it would get morality off the ground it would also motivate us to act um, you know, for the right reasons, without um, having to do it in, a, in, an, in, in an intellectual manner. You could then also justify it in an intellectual manner if need be, um, but you wouldn't have to. You could act directly on the basis of these feelings. Mm -hmm. um, and then that would answer a huge problem in kind of ethics, which is, well, if we're moved by our desires and by our will, but our desires and our will undermine our moral reasoning capacity, then how can we be moved by reason alone? Mm -hmm. And this way, this would explain, well, in fact, we're not moved by reason alone. We're moved by, or unless you include the affect of reason as a part of reason, we're moved by our feelings, just as we always thought. We're moved by our desires. It's just that some of our desires are specifically moral desires. So, so the mo motivational component that, that some people seem problematic disappears, kind of. Uh, and I was also wondering, indeed, because I was also reading the, the religion text, basically, and there it also yeah. talks about the change of heart, basically. Oh, yes, yes. And, and, and I think that, that, that might be interesting, uh, uh, kind of, to connect to your view. Uh, yes, yes. How can we basically, uh, uh, so to speak, kind of finish our moral task? And if not, how can we still be, be judged to be moral? Um, mm -hmm. So maybe you have something to say about that specifically, like this change of heart component and how it potentially uh, um, fits in uh, to your sensibility first view. I'm not sure if you, you thought about this, but yeah, that might be. Oh, yes, I have. Yeah, yeah, quite a bit because it's an actually, and you could probably see right off the bat, you know, what I was saying before about philosophy in general as a, as a personal transformative, in addition to being a theoretical enterprise, also a personal transformative exercise right. um, and then a moral exercise and then a political exercise. So I think Kant is really um, uh, has struck upon something in this notion of what he calls a revolution of the will or a revolution of the heart in the religion, um, in part because what he's trying to explain there um, is how it's possible to do the wrong thing uh, freely. Mm -hmm. The way he had originally formulated freedom in the groundwork for the metaphysics of morals, and to some extent in the critique of practical reason, um, you're acting morally, this is the way it seems, and uh, in some places he actually formulates it this way, you're acting morally, uh, sorry, you're acting freely if and only if you're acting morally, for the morally right reasons. It follows that if you act badly, then you're not acting freely, therefore you're, you don't have responsibility for it, therefore no one can reasonably blame you for it because you're just, as it were, you've turned into a machine at that point, or you've turned into some kind of beastly uh, mm -hmm. creature. And so therefore you can't be responsible for, nor can you take responsibility yourself for your own bad actions. And um, Kant really hadn't solved that problem in the, in the groundwork and in the, mm -hmm. he took a step towards it in the second critique, the critique of practical reason, by saying, well, we can, you know, through the affect of reason, but I think what he didn't quite make as clear as possible is that the affect of reason can be felt by those who are acting badly as well. Mm -hmm. 
So in other words, and every, I think everyone knows just from, as it were, phenomenology of one's own moral experience, you can know the right thing to do, but fail to do it. Mm -hmm. you, what's sometimes called weakness of will, which is a slightly misleading, I think. But in any case, you can be a conflicted, and we are mostly most of the time in some sense, except the most you know, conceited people. Uh, we are conflicted about our own you know, desires and motivations and so on. We can sense the right thing to do, but we don't always do it. In fact, we often do just the opposite thing and so on. But uh, what Kant really needs is a way of explaining how we can sense the right thing to do, still do the wrong thing, but also be corrigible beings in the sense that are beings capable of more perfection in the sense that we could improve, we could learn from that perhaps if we haven't killed ourselves or been killed by somebody else, we could learn from that. And then the next time around in a similar situation, you know, act in accordance with our own highest conception of ourselves and representation of the moral law. Well, Kant says that then, so our normal condition is a condition of what he calls radical evil. And I take that to be just that we're basically quite egoistic in our ordinary behavior and so on. We're ten we tend to be focused on our own feelings and our own point of view. But it's not that that's outside the realm of moral morality altogether. It's rather that within that capacity to be focused on ourselves and so on, we're also fully capable, unless we're um, insane or, you know, um, patholo you know, deformed patholo you know, deformed rationally and so on, and just are incapable of recognizing the moral law. But ordinary, healthy, sane people are equally capable of basically shifting their attitude, shifting the center of all their attitudes away from a narrowly egocentrically centered egoistically centered point of view to a view that takes into account the dignity of others and perhaps even a more universal standpoint on morality. And then we, when we shift, when we undergo the gestalt shift from thinking about everything from just our own point of view, an egoistic, perhaps pleasure-centered, uh, consequentialist, let's leave aside consequentialism, but anyway, an egoistic point of view to a non-egoistic, non-hedonistic point of view, that's a revolution of the heart. And that's a revolution of the will. But it's not like you're projecting yourself into something that you weren't capable of in the first place. It's rather a, ca a capacity that's there in you from the start and might have been manifest in various ways that weren't well developed and so on. So to the extent that we're capable of undergoing that gestalt shift, shift in our own attitude towards ourselves and others, then we're moving towards a point of view. Rather, we're moving into a, the moral point of view, like from a Kantian sense, and we become capable of acting for the right reasons and acting for the sake of the moral law and acting for the sake of respect for others. And it's a matter of degree, not a matter of on off. In other words, mm -hmm. it's be binary, I think. So I think Kant to present it as though here we are mired in radical evil, and then somehow we project ourselves out of it by this gestalt, this emotional or attitudinal gestalt shift into another way of looking at things. And then we become, you know, morally as perfect as it is possible to be for finite beings. But I, I don't think that's the right way of thinking about it. I think it's that we can do it to some degree and we should be part of our project as you know, rational animals trying to have good, um, authentic, principled lives is we should try to do that as much as we can and develop a life or over our lives more focused on the, you know, the moral point of view, mm -hmm. the shift to thinking about things non-egoistically um, and from a, and roughly speaking from the side of what I call dignitarian ethics, mm -hmm. which thinking about respect for oneself, but prime, you know, first and foremost, respect for others is, um, as well. And that as we shift in and out of the, ego, the egoistic point of view, 
to the non-egoistic point of view, we're undergoing a revolution of the will. Mm -hmm. um, and the more it happens, the more it fully revolutionizes our lives. Okay, awesome. This has been so great. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Henna. Um, yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, it has been a pleasure learning more about Yeah, it. I've really enjoyed okay. it too. Thank you. Great. So thank you so much. And um, hopefully in another episode, we can talk about uh, Kant and the uh, foundations of analytic philosophy. Um, yes. But for now, it has been so great. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much. And again, thank you for